Welcome to this last round of talks. Actually, thanks for, for visiting this session and still sticking around after an already exciting conference day. So what I'm going to talk to you in this, in this uh, last 50 minutes of this conference is it will be about an approach that uh, allows us to do stream processing uh, based on, on a SQL-like language. And uh, I want to do that based on a simplified version or actually simplified uh, scenario of a real-world IoT use case. Uh, so it will be about uh, sensor data readings coming from private households that we are uh, going to process later in a, in a streaming fashion. Um, now what was important for me when I uh, built up this talk was that uh, at least all the practical elements to this talk can uh, either are either based on open source technologies or at least free of charge technologies so that you can uh, conveniently try that from the comfort of your home if you want to dig deeper afterwards. So, uh, before starting, maybe just a few quick words about myself. Uh, so, my name is Hans-Peter and I'm uh, coming from, from Graz, Austria. I'm working and living there. Uh, from a job perspective, well, I would say the status is kind of complicated since I'm currently doing three things, uh, more or less at the same time. So, first and foremost, I'm working as a technical trainer at Netconomy, uh, where we are building large e-commerce solutions for our customers. I'm working there as a technical trainer, um, focusing on, on, on back-end development and uh, mostly doing Java or JVM-related stuff these days. Um, besides that, I'm working as an independent consultant and engineer, uh, helping uh, some smaller clients to build uh, and design uh, data architectures, either on-premise ones or cloud-based ones. Uh, and time permitting, I'm, I'm sometimes teaching also as an associate lecturer. Um, and yes, from, from time to time, I'm uh, sharing some of my thoughts and experiences at, at conferences, which is why I'm uh, here today. Um, but let's get down to business and actually start this uh, journey with a seemingly trivial question, right? W what is stream processing or just streaming for short? Um, and I won't even try to come up with a, with a definition or kind of exact explanation on my own. I think we can find several ones in the wild. But uh, one which I find particularly useful and want to share with you is uh, by a guy called Tyler Akidao, who describes streaming as a type of data processing with infinite uh, design with infinite data sets in mind. And while it's very generic in nature, I, I think it still captures the essence of what streaming is about rather nicely, right? That, namely, that we are able to deal with uh, unbounded data sets. And I think we can agree that streaming is definitely a big deal these days. So um, if, we, if we take a look at how modern businesses operate, I, I, I think we see several different categories of data across industries which fall into this category. Uh, now, uh, whenever we as engineers have to deal with never-ending streams of data, I think it's, it's, it's helpful to have uh, some kind of purpose-built systems for that, systems that have been designed with exactly that use cases in mind. Um, and um, when, when we do that, I, I think we know that just processing data is, is not good enough anymore. Uh, we, we need to do that as fast as possible, near real time, so to speak, and, and, and we want to answer business questions uh, in a timely fashion. And uh, one thing, uh, this, th this is also one, th one thing why, why purpose-built stream processing technologies can help us to achieve these lower kinds of latencies that we are striving for. So. I think wh while it sounds rather rather clear that it makes sense, in, at least in some areas of different kinds of businesses, to leverage stream processing, I think it's, it's not always as straightforward as it seems. Uh, and there are, again, uh, several different challenges involved into that, uh, but, I, but I think what I, what I personally found when I was talking to customers and, and, and people who want to use it is um, that they are somewhat hesitant when it comes to adopting these new kinds of technologies. And, and, and I don't even blame anyone for that. I think the reason is just that, uh, that most of us are still used to, to this kind of batch-driven thinking that we did mostly over the last uh, decades. So um, that, that being said, uh, I think uh, this is just one part of, of the actual explanation. And, and another part, I think, can be found if we take a look at the streaming landscape. Uh, which has literally exploded over the last, um, you know, couple of years or so. And, 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 and this slide here just depicts um, a very limited subset of, of, of stream processing technologies that you can find. Uh, actually, uh, all of them are, are, are open source and most of them, if not all, are under the uh, Apache uh, Software Foundation umbrella. Uh, and I think this, even, even by taking such a reduced kind of, 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 of subset of technologies, I, I'm not even, again, 
um, having any, any um, you know, vendor specific or, or proprietary commercial kind of systems there. I, even just looking at these, it's, 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 it's quite hard to, to know or even decide uh, where to even start with. And this is what people are struggling with. But, but I guess uh, it's, it's actually really hard to, uh, to try and find what's, what's the, the perfect match for your use case, right? That, that a lot of these technologies can do several great things. They have their strengths and weaknesses, but I think it's, it's, it's out of scope to try and come up with a detailed uh, comparison, which uh, definitely would would deserve a talk in its own right. So, also, I, I personally, for example, only know three of these to some degree. Um, and uh, this is why I basically, of course, ma made some kind of upfront choice. Uh, and, and, and I want to introduce you today to, to KSQL, which uh, uh, is baked by Apache Kafka under the covers. Um, and uh, so Apache Kafka, I, I guess most of you have at least heard about it, um, if not maybe even tried it already. So the thing is, w whenever we enter, or if you are new to, to, to Kafka and, and, and you try to read something about it, gather some information, hear somebody speak about it, I think you, you will immediately be confronted with the fact that Kafka is deemed a, a so-called streaming platform. And at the same time, I think it, it's very legitimate to, uh, to, to wonder wh what that actually means, what the heck is a streaming platform anyway. Uh, in, in, instead of trying to do that uh, on, on some kind of high-level architecture, I, I want to uh, try to discuss this uh, and hopefully it, uh, the demo that we will see later on also clarifies at least some of the parts a bit better. Um, I want to do that by looking, uh, walking you briefly through the main uh, touch points, interaction points, APIs, so to speak, that we as developers have when we build solutions on top of Kafka. First of all, of course, we need to find a way uh, to bring data into Kafka. There are several different ways. Uh, the, the, the lowest level one, if you want, is to use a, a thing called the producer API. Uh, you write an application uh, in any popular language. You can use uh, these APIs. Uh, and you just send uh, your data to, uh, to Kafka topics and, and, and store them in, 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 in partitions. Uh, so uh, that is the part uh, where where, where you start with when you, when you don't try to do anything more sophisticated than that. And actually Kafka is not opinionated at all what you handed it. At, at the end of the day what it does is it happily stores sequences of bytes. Uh, mechanisms like serialization and deserialization to different uh, message structures are done, under, uh, are done by, by this uh, mechanism that is in place. So you can easily use uh, things like JSON or Avro, which are the most common ones. Also, protobuf, uh, there are some things going on. But officially, it supports JSON and Avro. Uh, then to, to get data back out again and do something with it, uh, you have co the, the consumption side, uh, build applications that, that read from any of these topic partitions and start to process data. The nice thing about that is that we uh, are completely free how we want to consume this data, meaning we can consume data multiple times, we can, we, we can go back in time, replay old messages if we were to need that. So we have a mechanism based on offsets which allow us to exactly pinpoint uh, uh, s some of uh, the message uh, uh, or exactly pinpoint where we want to start to consume the messages that have been persisted in this append uh, only lock kind of structure uh, that sits uh, under the covers. Now these again two low-level APIs when you want to build data integration uh, things, uh, data integration pipelines, you would rather use something else, the, the Kafka Connect framework which allows you to literally connect uh, any data source with uh, any data sync by just putting Kafka in between and decouple this flow. So this, uh, this allows us to do uh, away with uh, lots of point-to-point -point connections that we may find if we try to, um, you know, uh, connect several systems or, or services in our landscape. Uh, and there are po a lot of uh, uh, turnkey-ready connectors available out there, official ones, community-supported ones, for, I, I think, more or less all the, all the popular data stores that you would, uh, uh, that you would probably know. Uh, I would be surprised if you uh, work on a data store where you don't find any such connector already available. Then, of course, stream processing. There was this idea to allow uh, low, uh, lightweight uh, stream processing, uh, to build lightweight stream processing applications, and there's the KStreams API for that. Um, it allows us to, just by including another dependency in, into our Java application, typically, uh, and build uh, stream processing uh, applications uh, based on the data that is flowing through Kafka. Um, actually, we, we, we can, right after uh, including the dependency, we can start coding. 
Now the coding part to it is also the part wha what I would consider or at least some people would see it as a, some kind of non-functional shortcoming. Um, you have to have uh, either Java or Scala skills in order to leverage this uh, K-Streams uh, uh, API. And exactly for that reason, uh, something else was built and this is called KSQL. Uh, and KSQL itself is actually the name for, for or refers to two things. Uh, first of all, it, it refers to Kafka's streaming SQL engine. Um, and it's also the name for a declarative SQL-like stream processing language that uh, you can use instead of having to write uh, real application code in, in Java or Scala. And uh, actually, it, uh, that the, main, uh, uh, the main benefits it promises, uh, uh, there are two main ones that they promise. Uh, one is that uh, it even gives uh, developers, you know, these folks that were, would be able to write application code, of course, uh, but the, it, it helps developers to be even more productive, right? We, 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 we all know that SQL is a language which is, very, which is very concise when it comes to expressing uh, querying needs. Um, but I think more important than that is the fact that uh, it, it unlocks stream processing for the masses. It, it literally anyone uh, who has just some kind of SQL knowledge can start uh, to analyze data in a streaming fashion by leveraging what we are know or, or what we know actually from 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 interacting uh, with other systems like traditional databases so the way this works is uh, that uh, we can write queries uh, we write sql uh, or an sql like um, language it is uh, in in some areas it's it's standard sql in some others it's 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 adapted or extended uh, and, and deviates a bit from the standard uh, but most of the things are, are quite familiar uh, at first contact. So uh, this means uh, this is also the reason why it has an extremely low entry barrier. We feel immediately at home. We have at least some fam familiar syntax. We have similar semantics, at least in certain areas. Uh, and we have just a concise and expressive way to filter, to project, to do aggregations. And actually also because we are talking about streaming data, we need to have some concepts to define windows in which, for example, we want to do certain operations to happen, like aggregating within certain windows in time. And every time uh, it's, it's not enough to, uh, or if you need more than the out-of-the-box feature set, you, again, would need a developer for, th for that part to extend uh, what KSQL allows you to do, and you can write user-defined functions or user-defined aggregate functions. So basically, you can write uh, anything that you would like in these functions uh, just by pro implementing a few interfaces uh, and, and writing some Java code. <coughs> so uh, again, to put this in context, uh, if, we, if we try to, uh, to compare that on, 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 on these dimensions, so one is level of abstraction, the other one is uh, flexibility versus ease of use. Uh, so this uh, consumer API uh, definitely finds itself in the lower lower left area. Uh, then Kafka Streams somewhere sits in, in the middle uh, of all of this, and, and both these were there to primarily make developers happy. Um, and KSQL uh, is there to hopefully make everyone happy. It sits enthroned in the upper right simply because it's uh, the simplest and, and, and highest level approach that we can have uh, to write stream processing applications, as we will see later on. So um, the way this works again is that when we write such queries, and we will see several examples in the in the in the demo part, is that these queries give us per record streaming in m at least sub-second, ideally millisecond latencies. Uh, and the way this works under the covers is that uh, these queries are parsed. They uh, will be compiled down into Kafka Streams code under the, under the hood. And that's why they also follow more or less the same execution model. So if you would know Kafka Streams uh, th that, uh, and, and have an idea how, how it operates, then uh, uh, this is very, very similar. And, and also you get similar things uh, how you can distribute now such uh, running querying, uh, uh, stri streaming query jobs across multiple instances just by launching multiple KSQL servers. And we can do that uh, using two main uh, modes of operation. One is called interactive mode. Uh, it's uh, a playground. It's literally a play playground for, for you know, inspecting your data, doing ad hoc stream analysis just by typing some queries, sending them uh, over a REST API to servers, and uh, inspect the results, right? So also perfect for uh, for um, letting data analysts explore uh, whatever there is uh, in Kafka already. 
letting data analysts explore maybe uh, things that are, uh, are, are generated uh, behind the scenes uh, on the fly by, by some other jobs, some other applications, so it doesn't really matter. You can simply tap into anything that, uh, that is there uh, for, uh, for you to process. Now this is a, a chart, uh, again, uh, so the interaction, uh, main mo mo uh, the main interaction tools are KSQL's very own CLI, which uh, I will show you uh, then uh, in a few moments. Then uh, there is a web UI provided by, by Confluent, which are building a nice uh, control center application. It's a browser-based application and you have a web UI uh, to, to do that probably a bit more conveniently than, than on, the, on the CLI, but still, in general, any client that is able to talk HTTP would, would, would be okay in order to interact with a KSQL server. And also when we send now these queries, the, the server instances, uh, again, they are running outside of your Kafka cluster, so uh, it's not the brokers that are doing these kinds of processing. It's really separate uh, 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 processes that are running next to your cluster. Uh, everything that we send to the, to the servers is persisted in a special topic, uh, uh, a special command topic in Kafka. And the reason for that is that, in general, we have more such servers to, to distribute the load. And this is some kind of synchronization mechanism so that, that every server that is taking part uh, in, in, in this specific cluster uh, knows what to process, in which order to process, and, 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 and what there is to do. The nice property is again, like like for other, uh, like for Kafka Streams applications themselves, that uh, if if we want to later decide and uh, to scale down, maybe we don't need three instances, or maybe we are just unlucky and we are losing one instance unexpectedly. The thing is, it will uh, scale down in a way uh, on purpose or by accident uh, because of errors, uh, so that uh, the other two servers step in. Uh, they happily process data for. Uh, and step in for, 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 the, for the loss of, of one instance, for example, and, and resume processing the data. And the nice property is that all the heavy lifting, that this works reliably, uh, is uh, actually completely hidden away uh, for those who are just writing uh, the queries and interacting with, with the servers. The other mode of operation, quickly, called the headless mode, uh, it's uh, working a bit different in the sense that we are writing our stream processing application in advance. We put all the statements that we would need in a single file. Um, then uh, during the bootstrap phase of a KSQL server instance, we just point these instances to this file. It will re start to read the file, generate Kafka Streams applications under the cover and happily process them. It's also a good way to some kind of, uh, have some kind of workload or use case specific isolation. And it also gets you uh, a bit uh, more of a secured environment in the sense that if you run this mode, it, it can be considered locked down due to the fact that uh, the REST API access is no longer possible. So this is just a safety measure that nobody c comes along, just connects to it and, and writes a probably terrible query which kills your, your production workload. So definitely this is the mode that you would use uh, in order to run production deployments uh, that should uh, n never be, uh, or, or that nobody ever should be able to, to manually interfere with. This is how it looks like. Again, instead we have we have no interaction layer anymore. It's just that we point these server instances to the corresponding SQL file, and then uh, it starts uh, to generate the jobs and, and starts the processing. Um, this is the way it works. I, this is also the scaling part for that mode works more or less uh, completely similar, which is why it's not shown here. Um, and I think this is uh, the time where we have done enough talking also already based on the slides. So I will, uh, I think, uh, let's get our hands dirty and see some of these things in action. And um, to do that, uh, actually, I prepared uh, some kind of end to end scenario. Uh, and this is what I want to discuss before. And then we are uh, diving into the mostly terminal sessions, looking at queries and things. So, um, Kafka in between, what we are going to do is we are uh, launching later on uh, two applications which will produce some data and send it to Kafka topics. So one is, is uh, actually using the producer API, just, just as a demonstration here, and ingests energy-related data coming from private households based on, 
on, on, on archived JSON files. So I'm, what I'm doing here is replaying old data from, from last summer. Th that is, uh, I think, in July 2018 it was created. Uh, and in addition to that, there is this, uh, an additional application which, which writes weather data to, uh, to Kafka coming from different uh, weather stations. In this case, it's, it's also ju just two, so two, two, two installations for, for the energy-related data and two weather stations. And this is a bit different in the sense that it just uh, uses, uh, instead of directly writing to Kafka, it uses the REST proxy which sits in between. Uh, and uh, the REST proxy then takes care uh, uh, to write the data to Kafka. Then uh, the stream processing part, of course, which is the, uh, the main focus for the demo. Uh, we look at some queries, what we can do, doing some window-based aggregations and things like that. Then, uh, s of course, this is not enough. You cannot stop there. In a, in, in a real-world scenario, you have to need most of the time for some kind of database, which is why I am showing you a very simple way to integrate what, what's done here, so, so the raw data, but as well as the pre-processed data by the streaming queries, uh, how to ship that over to an operational data store. And in this case, I decided to use MongoDB. It's, it's, it's a relatively good fit for the, data, uh, for the kind of data that we are dealing with here. Um, then uh, another approach is that you uh, write consuming applications. Uh, they can basically consume any topic uh, from Kafka in a reactive way and expose some kind of uh, web API to, to uh, have this consumed by, by basically any client. And finally, uh, a, a very uh, simple and basic uh, visualization. Uh, we are doing similar things, but instead of just exposing some kind of data, we are pushing it forward to to, to a visualization service. In this case, uh, it will be Power BI running, running on Azure. Um, so, so far for, for the, for the uh, planned uh, uh, components. So it's basically five steps that we are now going through. So step one is probably the least interesting one. Uh, it's just ingesting some sensor data. And for that, I'm just bringing up these two applications that you have seen on the slide in my terminal. So I'm just making sure that this thing is still running. So this is just a Confluent platform, which is a very convenient way to, to run a, a single node Kafka inst installation locally on your, on your machines. <coughs> so then I'm, I'm uh, already starting this uh, Java application, which will uh, ingest some weather data using the REST proxy. Another application which will uh, ingest some sensor data. So this one should start to ingest some, some data. Yes. Yeah. I can, but the font here for these two tabs is irrelevant. You don't want to see this. It's, it's just a lot of uh, debug output that, that comes back while the application ingests data. So uh, I will have a, a, a bigger font for, for the more interesting parts for sure. So this is the sensor data, a bit um, higher velocity. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm replaying data much faster than real time in the sense that normally most of the data we are talking about comes in some kind of minute intervals, uh, very few come in second intervals and uh, some others in, uh, in even only hours. So, so this is mostly minute-based data uh, and I'm re just replaying it faster so that there's a bit more to see uh, in, the streaming, uh, in the streaming queries that we write. So this is already done, so I won't go into detail there anymore. Uh, so the colorful and fun part is now about using k-sql streaming in order to, to try and, and do something with this data. So for that, I'm, I, I'm opening um, actually the, 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 C, uh, the Confluent k-sql CLI. Um, so and when I'm there, um, I, can st uh, I, I, I cannot just interact, and this is the, 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 the important part to start with, you cannot just start to use the topics that exist in Kafka. So what you do is uh, you typically start to create either streams or tables based on, on, on Kafka topics. And this is, for example, how it looks like to create this sensor data stream based on the Kafka topic. And what you then do is you specify the value format. In this case, it's JSON data. You specify the fields and data types. Uh, if optional, you can specify the timestamp, which then allows you to use event timestamp semantics instead of processing timestamp. Uh, and this is just I everything that you need to define a stream. Uh, another thing you can do is you can define a table. And tables are uh, working differently in the sense that you specify for a table like this one here, uh, the third one here, you specify a key. 
Um, and the key is actually there to tell the table uh, what, is, uh, what is the key of my records. Uh, and every time uh, Kafka receives in this topic uh, a record having the same key, uh, the table will basically reflect that and update the, uh, the, the, the most recent value that it had. So using that approach, you keep the latest known value for each and every key uh, of your messages. And I'm just pasting them in so that I have something to work with. You see it creates the streams and tables. And as soon as we have done that, uh, we can start to write queries. And I make that a big bigger. Is that big enough? Select star from this one. Uh, and then you would see data flying across my screen. Uh, my screen. Now what's, what's, what's important is this query runs basically until we terminate it. So it does not stop. It continuously gives you new results as new data arrives in the Kafka topic uh, and streams it, in this case, to the console window. So this is not data at rest, again, we are dealing with. Um, then what you can also do is uh, you can do uh, a bit more useful things, right? You can, uh, of course, do projections or, or slight uh, transformations of data. And you can also do, for example, a limit clause. And this simple query now would uh, obviously stop after having read 10 records. So we see this is the, the actual timestamp that comes with the message. I said I'm replaying old data here. Uh, uh, this is the serial number, this is the type of data, that uh, a type column uh, 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 which uh, refers to the kind of data that we would see, would see in the sensor data readings. So uh, another thing is that we can of course uh, do things like, like filters, right? We can start to filter only for a certain type of data by simply specifying a WHERE clause and all of a sudden we just see the data, which is in this case referring mostly to heating-related sensors and temperature-related sensors in the households. So if we do that, uh, we see that this is uh, uh, the, the map which contains all the different uh, sensor readings and their, and their values. Uh, so there's uh, quite a bunch of values in, in a single uh, data record. Uh, you see you have rich, rich structures here in, in a single column. Um, you can do that uh, if, you, if you need that. Um, and then uh, we can do things like we can uh, create, for example, based on existing streams, we can create derived streams. So in this case, I could say, well, uh, the one type of data, uh, control data, looks completely different, actually, than the, the, the other type of data, the heating-related data. Uh, and that's why it makes sense to split these streams up. They were originally landing in the, in the same topic, right? So. Uh, for that reason, I am uh, I'm just creating uh, these two new streams. So what you say is you define a new, uh, new stream uh, just by writing another query that is now filtering the original stream. Um, and this stream will be baked by, an, uh, by a separate Kafka topic that you can give there. Uh, and starting from now, uh, this topic will be filled in the background, uh, filtering out only these types of data that we are uh, actually uh, filtering here in the where clause. So, not, not the slides, this one actually. I do that same thing for the electricity related data, just that I have everything in place to, that we will need later. Well, so far so good. It's projections uh, and filters that we have seen so far, so not, not, not that interesting, I would say. So we can do more things, of course. We can uh, do I mean, this is the same thing, creating a table, but only for the weather station. So we what we can do here is we can keep track of the latest weather record for each and every station. You see that the station is given by its, uh, is used as a key. And this makes sure that uh, every time I get a new value, in uh, a new record into my topic for the same station, it will supersede uh, due to the table semantics uh, behind the scenes this record. And I create that also. And uh, then I show you the output of the query, which is probably a bit surprising. So the table is created. Then I see, well, this is the current uh, data of, the, of this weather station. Then I see the second weather station. And then you think it should stop. But also this query is querying a table, but it still runs. And it still shows me uh, further results. Uh, and this is the, 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 uh, or the reason for that is that also for when we are querying table semantics, we get uh, in our result set notifications that 
the table has changed because a key has been superseded with a new value uh, based on some record that made it into the underlying topic that, that feeds actually the, the table here. So with that we keep still the table only, at, uh, only knows uh, actually one r record for each and every station ID and you can, you can quickly uh, do uh, um, actually make sure that this is the case just by grouping on station ID and counting the elements. And if I do that, uh, you would see that despite we get updates, we only see the count is, or is always only one. So it will never increase because again, this is table semantics. And this is the weather station, latest record, just one is there. This is the other one, also only one is there. And now when we get an update, we still have only one record, but it just sh uh, showed us, for example, the updates up here when we were just using a normal select query. So far, so good. Um, then what's also in, in important to, to highlight is the fact that you can basically choose two different uh, uh, processing options based on the offset. Remember I said you can decide if you want, uh, where you want to start processing if you run such queries. And you have basically the choice here to say I want to start with the earliest message that is available or I want to start processing just right now, tapping into the stream uh, and listening to everything that, 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 that is coming uh, as of now. So I want to switch that uh, to the earliest so that the aggregation queries that I will uh, show you are starting basically from scratch, uh, considering all the records that we have ingested so far. Um, and this is just a an aggregation, right? A simple total aggregation. This is the query and I can just run it uh, or I again uh, define a table based on this query so that it gets persisted uh, again uh, baked by Kafka topic and what this does is it will just do an ever increasing count of how many, ev uh, uh, how many events there were for each specific device uh, specified by the serial number and the corresponding message type. And if I'm going to do that, uh, I have this table here and I can then uh, simply query this table here and see uh, that I get the expected results. So what, what it shows then is it will show for each uh, and every serial and type of data that we receive how many events there have already been there. So this is ever increasing counters that you would see. And again I have to terminate the query otherwise it would run indefinitely. So that's this part. So um, coming back again to uh, one more example. Well, so uh, we can do, uh, of course, more interesting things like doing uh, aggregations based on time windows. And what this tries to do is it tries to show based uh, the, the, the power consumption in kilowatt hours uh, that uh, was uh, or the power that was consumed within one hour windows. You, you see that you are basically writing a, a, a normal query you group by the serial number to, to get, an, uh, 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 to get uh, for every device to get this metric and then you specify a window and this is for example where, where it starts as I said to deviate from, from typical SQL um, uh, dialects uh, that you may know. You define in this case a tumbling window of, of one hour in size. This means that you will do the aggregations uh, on an hourly basis on consecutive non-overlapping windows. If you do that, uh, you get the expected, uh, the expected result in the sense that you would now see, again, it will reprocess all the data. You see very clearly, for example, in this, and uh, let me just, uh, no, le le let's run it for a while. Uh, and then, uh, for example, what we see for each and every device, uh, we now track a specific window, which is always one hour in size, and we see uh, that, for example, I this device uh, 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 tells us that, it, that between uh, 2 and uh, 3 in the afternoon on the 11th of July there were 38 events that were, that, that, that were measured and in total it, it summed up to 0 0.6 kilowatt hours in this one hour period. So and you can uh, do, of course, do that thing in any granularity that you would need. It's very easy to do that on a daily basis just by swapping out the time interval, basically the exact same query. You just say size one days and all of a sudden it will uh, keep track of uh, uh, daily windows uh, and update the data on the fly behind the scenes. So then 
joints. Uh, joints is probably another one which I want to show. Uh, we can, of course, also join data. Very, very uh, useful thing. So what we do by that is mostly we, we, we have some streams of data and, and we are lacking some information in the streams. We want to enrich the streams based on some further additional information like metadata, customer data, whatever it is. Then you can see that, that, that you can easily do that as well. Uh, very familiar, again, to, to what you are used to from doing SQL. So you just write your select query from the original sensor stream, and then you say you want a left join against the IoT customer data, which is a table semantic, meaning it will give you the latest known metadata that it will join based on the serial number field. Uh, of a customer, okay? So for that, and in addition to that, if we do that, we see that, for example, we have a new field called the, uh, uh, the description of the, uh, of the installation uh, or, the, or the device. Uh, we have also field information which weather station is attached to this um, uh, customer and if this is an active customer. And we can then, based on the join, filter out only the active customers who are still paying. Um, let me do that. So I create, again, I could just run the query or, again, persist everything uh, so that uh, uh, it keeps track of it in the background. And if we do that, uh, the stream is already running and we can then uh, take a look at the enriched information, um, which now tells me for each and every record, and I will um, pause that and then show it to you. So now I have not only the device and timestamp and the data, I have also this information which customer device and is it an active one or not. So data that is not there in the original stream, it was just joined um, on the fly as the new data arrived. So with that actually, uh, I, what, I, what, what, I, what I forgot to do I guess in the beginning, which is why I'm doing it now, uh, I will run and I will just make sure that this is right. Show streams. You can do such things like you see the streams that you created, you that the formats, the topics that are baking the streams. You can do the same thing for the tables. And yes, uh, uh, I, I forgot to do that. So uh, again, uh, the, the, the upcoming uh, demo needs a few more things which I was not able to show uh, in detail. So I will just copy that. Uh, is that everything is there that I will need for the rest of, of this talk. So this is basically the same queries, it's just a bit more. Um, I called it headless here, which is not completely true, but this is what you would deploy uh, using a headless, um, headless approach, just the statements, and this is what you would point uh, the KSQL servers to, and they would start to run that in this headless mode. And I'm just pasting that in so that I make sure that all the things that I need uh, for the rest of the demo uh, is there. Yeah, it does a bunch of things. Now I should have all the streams that I will need later. Yeah, now I have a bit more. That's good. You can also see all the queries that are currently running. You see, I mean, it's not so nicely formatted, of course, it's a CLI, but you see basically a, a, an ID, you see uh, the, the underlying um, uh, tables or streams, and you see the original statement that was used to create this, uh, this query. And you see that for all the queries that are currently running. Well, with that, I think I want to switch to the next step, step three. Uh, before that, I think you should know by now that what I did is I did not query a database table here. I hope you know that. Instead, you realize the truth. There is so far literally no such thing as a database table uh, behind the scenes. But talking about databases, I said uh, now we are pro doing stream processing, uh, but all the data is somehow not exposed. It's not, we cannot consume it directly. So oftentimes uh, you, you need a way to ship at least parts of the data from Kafka to somewhere else. And this somewhere else, again, in, in, in my case here, is a NoSQL database, which is MongoDB. It's just MongoDB because, it's, as I said, it's a good fit. Uh, I, I know it reasonably well, and I also wrote uh, uh, one such Kafka connector on my own, which is uh, what I'm going to use now. So we have uh, a MongoDB running here. I have uh, these uh, databases that are there. So the one that uh, we will get an additional one after I start uh, the streaming ETL jobs based on Kafka Connect in the background. And I said uh, all we need for that is configuration. And this is literally true. So this is, for example, everything you need, uh, this snippet of JSON configuration, 
uh, only this part because it's several ones. Uh, so this snippet gives you the ability to, for example, ingest uh, these derived streams. You know, we, we took the base stream, split it apart into two topics. Uh, then you define the connector class, which is my own connector here. Uh, then you define that it's JSON. Uh, you give it a MongoDB connection URL. And that's basically it. The rest is not so interesting, OK? And literally, by posting such snippets to the REST end endpoint of Kafka Connect, the streaming ETL job uh, starts to run behind the scenes and happily ingests data into uh, the data store, which is MongoDB in this case. So I will just uh, do, I have just five of them. So instead of just uh, showing that this works basically on raw data, you can, of course, now uh, uh, ship data that is uh, calculated behind the scenes by KSQL, these, you know, these hourly aggregates that we have seen. You can also ship them to, to, to MongoDB and probably serve uh, this kind of data for, for showing dashboards in, a, in an end user facing client application. Um, so, uh, and, and there are some other aggregations that are done behind the scenes. Uh, so it's in, in total five such connectors that I'm just uh, uh, running by posting these five configurations. To, uh, to the endpoint, and let's see, I will go into a different tab, I will post them in, ideally this works, right, it's my own dog food that I'm eating here, so in theory I should know if every, everything it does ever to, to, to data, uh, and let's see if it worked, so refresh, we have a new database, we have seven collections in there. We have electricity related data. This is looking like that. We have the heating related data looking totally different. This was the separation of the, of the raw streams. We have the, uh, the, hourly aggregate, uh, the, the hourly aggregates in place. Uh, it looks like that. Shows me for each and every, every window the number of events and the power consumption that happened within this uh, uh, hour of, of, of the corresponding day. We have that for the daily uh, aggregates as well. And we have, uh, this is also interesting, the sensor counts thing that I've shown you. Maybe better to see it in, in a tabular fashion here. We have this, uh, remember this total uh, counting of, of how many numbers for each and every device uh, and type of data we got. And if I refresh that, you see the numbers are continuously updated based on what the streaming job of Kafka SQL, uh, of, of KSQL does behind the scenes. So this is streaming ETL just by configuration and nothing else. Uh, and you can do that with a bunch of different data stores, like I said. So, eight minutes left. So reactive notifications is already step four. So uh, the idea there is that we, again, not, not just push the data to some data store, but maybe we just want to expose some, some of this data to, to any consuming client. And I, again, for, for the sake of simplicity, decided to, to go with a, with a Spring Boot uh, reactive uh, web stack kind of application. Very lightweight uh, in that sense. Uh, it uses uh, Webflux under the covers, and uh, I will bring it up. Then notific... No, this is not the correct thing. There it sh oh yeah have to switch over to my to my cheat sheet. This is the this is actually the application that I want to run the Notify app, and what it will do is it will it will behind the scenes start to reactively consume from two topics. One is this ever increasing sensor counter aggregation that is uh, triggered by KSQL, and the other is this hourly. Uh, consumption of energy data. And then we can simply, uh, after bringing it up, uh, use any HTTP client to, to tap into this stream. So now the Spring Boot application hopefully comes up, which it does. Looks good. So and now, again, I have no fancy, you know, single page application or that kind of thing. But just to show that to you that this is working as expected, I will just tap with into this stream by, by using curl. Uh, and the way this works is that Webflux pushes this uh, data down uh, in a streaming fashion, in this case over server sent events. But the same thing can be done very, very similar if you would need WebSockets. So, and if I'm doing that, well, I'm now hooking into this stream 
that's computed behind the scenes again by KSQL, and this is the server sent events that would be pushed down to any kind of HTTP client that you want to feed with this data. The same, of course, I can do just for completeness reasons with the other one. And then we are approaching our last five minutes. This is the hourly uh, consumption uh, for, again, for a specific device. We should see something. Yeah. So we get uh, updates uh, about, you see, it's, it's increasing the number of events which fall into the same hour. It's still the same window that we are operating on. Uh, and it's still the serial number that we want to know the data about. So that is uh, the thing, what you can do, uh, basically expose anything that you want using a project called Reactor Kafka, uh, using it together with Spring's Reactive Web Stack, and there you go. Uh, you can uh, basically push down to any uh, number of clients uh, that are interested all the data that is computed in a streaming fashion by KSQL queries. So coming back to the slides, and this is already the Fifth and last step, the live dashboards thing, as I said, a, a, very, a very basic version, but still it's, it's more or less a similar application, but instead of exposing this data over service and event, it just takes them and pushes them to, to Power BI. So I will bring up my Power BI here. I prepared two dashboards. Um, this is uh, streaming dashboards uh, of Power BI. So one is the energy one and the other one is, is the weather data. I think we look at the energy one because it's a bit more interesting. This Again, it's the same data that we are talking about, these hourly, uh, no, it's not the hourly aggregates. In this case, I have a, s a different aggregation, which is smaller in granularity. It uses 10 minute uh, aggregates, so that we have, again, more, more updates to our visualization. And I'm just bringing it up uh, and push this data to, this is the weather data, this is not so interesting. This is the sensor data. And this will push now this uh, to Power BI. Let's see. And there we go. We see basically two charts, uh, one chart, and we are here somewhere in the, in the afternoon of some day. So we are uh, down here, we see the number of events that were calculated in this window. Up here, we see the power consumption. You see nothing. The reason you see nothing is uh, this is summer and it was obviously a good day and this installation of the customer has a photovoltaic installation meaning it's generating data and it consume it, it consumes nothing from the power grid uh, because uh, it come uh, it comes with its own um, uh, electricity that is created during this time of the day we can just simply switch that over to the other device which doesn't have a photovoltaic panel in place uh, so there we should see also some um, actually some uh, consumption values if you are wondering why they are not there. So just pushing that and then we check again. So here we now should see up there in a few seconds hopefully we should see also not only the counts but also some some power consumption there. Let me check that. Hmm. Yeah. There you go. And, and there is the power consumption in 10 minute windows. Here is the kilowatt hours that was uh, consumed. And here is the number of events that were considered in this uh, specific uh, 10 minute window. So this is just a basic approach towards getting stream, streaming kind of visualization as well. So with that, uh, the example driven part is over. I think we can say mission accomplished. Uh, to some degree, we were at least able to deal with all of these aspects and have some kind of hopefully end-to-end -end idea what, what all of this streaming platform that Kafka is about can do for us. Um, to wrap this up, I think uh, KSQL is really, really approachable. It's probably the most accessible stack that you can find these days. It's streaming with SQL and nothing but SQL. Uh, you get the same scalability and fault tolerance thanks to the things it builds upon, uh, Kafka itself and uh, KStreams. It's deployable anywhere. You just deploy KSQL servers as normal Java applications, either on bare metal, in, in, in VMs, in containers, in using orchestrators like Kubernetes. It doesn't really matter. And, and it's also important that this is not nothing that's only useful for, uh, for very large, massive, high-velocity kind of use cases. It, it's perfectly fine to use that approach for, 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 for smaller scales as well. 
And it's just, now I'm standing between you and the beer, so it's just, bear with me one more moment. So uh, what I can tell you from my personal experience and journey with Kafka in general and, and KSQL in particular is that it worked out pretty well for me so far. Um, and uh, I can confidently say that if I have been faster, it is by streaming on the shoulders of Kafka. I think your mileage may vary on that, for sure. Uh, but if it's one thing and one thing only that I would really like you to remember from this talk, it's that even if your obsession tells you to do batching, I tell you to walk away and stream with KSQL. The choice is yours. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions now. Uh, also, don't forget, uh, a big shout out to uh, a sponsor, actually Confluence sponsored a great swag box. I didn't even look into that myself. So come in front and grab some, some t-shirts, stickers, whatever it is they put there. And I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, also, uh, just talk to me afterwards if, 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 if it takes longer, uh, you know, over a drink. Is there anything right now? Yeah, there's one question. Uh, what, what do you, so the question was, is, is, is it possible to have moving data windows? I think we need to clarify what you mean. So actually, what KSQL does is it, it gives you different kinds of window semantics. Tumbling windows, hopping windows, and session-based windows. Uh, and I'm not sure what you're exactly referring to with moving windows. Uh, so for example, if I have a flat line for, for 10, minu 10 minutes, then I want, want to see it. And I don't want to have a one hour cut between these 10 minutes and then it's not showing up in my uh, query. So uh, what, 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 what you probably mean, so first of all, you can reduce the size. Uh, you can have an overlap. So if, if you configure windows to be hopping, you can say something like, I, I have four hour windows and I'm only advancing by one hour, then you always have three hours overlap uh, where okay. the data is in both of them. Okay? Ah, okay, this is what you can do. So you can bring that down, for example, to five minute windows and, have an, uh, and, and, have an and let them advance by uh, one uh, minute, then you have a four minute overlap, things like that. And the other completely different approach is to have session-based windows, which are working differently in the sense that they, ha they are more or less all different in size, varying in size, and, and this works in a way that uh, they, they, they expire based on inactivity of, of uh, not seeing new data for a specific key. So in that sense, uh, it, it's like a user session that can expire after some time of inactivity. And this is also what you would get. And if you would use that session-based window semantics, you could do things like uh, always start a new window if we haven't seen data for a specific key for 10 minutes. Okay. Then you get a new window and so on. Okay? So this is currently the windowing semantics that you get. Probably they will add more in the future, but uh, currently that's, that's it. Okay, thanks. Any, any other questions? Yeah? Here you go. Just wait for the mic, please. Hi, I just have one question about uh, Kafka, just to make sure that I understand it correctly. Yeah. Is it just a platform that streams and doesn't store anything except like in memory? I don't know. Because no, you I use this early, right? You yeah, can yeah. start at the very beginning, so, so it that does persist. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's a very great question. And actually, uh, it's just that I, I, I didn't have the time in this session to go into the details of, of Kafka itself. Of course, it, it's not just an in-memory thing. It's a, it, it's a persisted uh, append log. This is how it works. And you have different ways and means to configure how long it should persist messages. You can do that based on time. You can do that based on size. Uh, and you can define different data retention policies. And Kafka has a, some kind of reaper process, which will clean it up according to the policies you define. If you go, uh, to the if you go all in, uh, you, you, ha you, you keep data indefinitely, if you can afford that based on storage. Uh, it, it never expires anything, so uh, literally you could store 
till your very first message that you ever sent to Kafka, if you if you can can um, afford the, the corresponding uh, you know storage and, and everything that you would need for that. So it's definitely persisted. Yes. Other questions? Yeah. Just a, fo a follow up of questions of the uh, one before. The tables and the streams are in memory, or do you have also something persisted? No, no, of, co of, of course not. In you, you said every time you define this create table as select something or create stream as select something, you define the baking underlying Kafka topic. Oh. And everything that, 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 that uh, flows through this stream or, or updates this table will be persisted to the topic as well. Yeah. Other questions? I think it's almost beer time, right? So, just one more question yeah. about the topic. So, when you use the the, the API to to insert the data, uh, you give the, the identifier that you then uh, later on you use for the topic. Is that right? So you, you you are so so the question is uh, how uh, did the data find its way into the corresponding topic? Is that the question? Yes, how to map the data. Yes, so what you do is uh, when you produce this data, uh, and, and I use the, the producer API for one app, and, and, and for the weather data, I use the REST proxy. So every message that you produce, no matter by which means, uh, is targeted towards a specific topic. Okay, so you specify the topic when you write the message. Uh, and uh, also, what, what happens behind the scenes is that these topics are partitioned. Uh, this is the, the mechanism how Kafka scales and distributes things. Um, and there is, if, if you don't specify any, uh, so if, first of all, if a message has no key, it does a round robin partitioning, then you don't know where your messages end up. If you have a key, it, it uses by default a hash partitioning, meaning it makes sure that if it's, ha if it's the same key, that it will always end up in the same partition of the corresponding topic. That's, that's basically the way it works. And you can write custom partitioners if you would need that. I think with that we can call it a day. Uh, yeah, beer time, uh, have fun. Uh, thanks again for coming and thanks for having me.